Ken Landau, thanks for watching. Let's talk about the z -pack. That's azithromycin. It's a broad-spectrum antibiotic, good against certain kind of bacteria. It injures them, but requires the body's immune system to really finish the bacteria off. It's not good against the common cold, not good against the flu. Every time you have a sore throat, you shouldn't run to the doctor and get an antibiotic because it's not going to work. It's probably going to cause you some side effects. And it's not good against allergies. 2010, it was the most commonly prescribed outpatient antibiotic here in the United States. And if we look at all prescriptions, in 2017, it was number 11. If we look at other countries, say Sweden, they rarely use it at all. Talk about all of the money it takes to develop antibiotics. This one was developed in the late 1970s in Zagreb, Croatia. I don't think they had a big R&D budget. They synthesized it from erythromycin. They changed the erythromycin. They added a nitrogen, did some other kind of things to it. And then they got azithromycin. Now we know it is the z -pack. Well, they started off with relatively little money. They patented the drug, first in Yugoslavia. Then they partnered in 1986 with the Pfizer pharmaceutical company. Pfizer brought it out here in the United States and throughout the rest of the world after 1991. But the Pleva, that pharmaceutical company, retained the rights to sell it over in Eastern and Central Europe. It's good against certain kind of bacteria, bacteria strep bacteria. It's good against the Staph aureus that's sensitive to penicillin. The kind that's resistant, well, it's no good. And as a matter of fact, most of the staph we have nowadays is resistant to penicillin, so this isn't a good drug for that. It's good against the Haemophilus influenza. That's very common in kids, common cause of ear infections, common cause of throat infections, older people, common cause of pneumonia. It's also good against Legionnaire's disease and whooping cough. Uh, it kills certain kind of anaerobic bacteria, bacteria that grow without oxygen. Unfortunately, they constitute the mass of the intestinal and the vaginal organisms. So when you take this drug, it's not uncommon to get GI problems and also a vaginitis. It's good against the organism that causes a very common cause of community-acquired pneumonia. We call that chlamydia pneumonia. And it's good against chlamydia you get in your genital tract and certain other kind of organisms that cause genital infection. So people tend to use it for strep throat or bronchitis, certain kind of skin infections, or maybe even traveler's diarrhea. And people who are going to the dentist who have artificial heart valve, well, they might take it 30 to 60 minutes before the procedure in order to prevent an infection in the heart. Once upon a time, it was very commonly used for syphilis. Now it's not very commonly used for gonorrhea, but now gonorrhea is resistant oftentimes to antibiotics. So oftentimes, if you're going to treat a person with gonorrhea, it takes a shot of ceftriaxone, a different kind of antibiotic, and then some azithromycin. And it also might help prevent certain kind of bacterial infection in the lung of HIV positive patients. So the government says, that it's pretty good to help treat and maybe even prevent some of the acute bacterial exacerbations or flares of chronic obstructive lung disease that people who were once upon a time smokers get, especially if they're due to those organisms that I just mentioned, might be also good for acute sinusitis if it happens to be bacterial in origin, but probably not as good as augmentin. It's a good drug to mention for treatment of certain kind of pneumonia, uncomplicated skin infections. Yeah, it's pretty good. Acute middle ear infections, acute otitis media, it's actually pretty good, but it's probably not the first choice. Probably take amoxicillin for that. And for either pharyngitis or tonsillitis, probably isn't any longer the first line drug, but it's still an acceptable treatment for people who get urethritis or cervicitis, inflammation of the urethra or the cervix, typically from chlamydia, it's a pretty good drug and can be used for gonorrhea, but 
In 2015, we noticed a remarkably highly resistant strain of gonorrhea. So that's why you have to get the shot of ceftriaxone in addition. Well, if a person's been sexually assaulted, this is a good antibiotic in combination with that ceftriaxone and some metronidazole to hopefully help prevent any sequelae of that sexual assault. It's an acid-stable antibiotic, so you can take it with or without food. doesn't seem to make much difference, except if you're going to take the sustained release oral suspension, then you shouldn't have any food within two hours of it. It's rapidly absorbed from the gut into the blood. It, about 30% of it, 35, 40% of it actually gets into the blood. Once it's in, seems to peak at about two to three hours if you take the immediate release and about five hours if you take the sustained release and stays in your body for somewhere between two and a half and three days. Comes in multiple different forms. You can take it as a film coated tablet or you can take it as a capsule or a suspension or you can get it as a little package that you dissolve in water or it comes in a suspension, either one that's immediately released or delayed release. Now the two can't be used interchangeably. It also comes as an ophthalmic medication at the present time. If you happen to have either some degree of kidney malfunction or liver malfunction, it's still okay to take the drug because it's not metabolized in the body. It actually goes out principally through the liver into the bile and is excreted in the bowels unchanged. About 5 to 10 percent goes out in the urine, again unchanged. Once the drug is in the bloodstream, it seems to concentrate in the phagocytes. Phagocytes are a type of white blood cell that go and attack bacteria. So it's good that they're attracted to the phagocytes because what the phagocytes do is they go right to the site of infection and they concentrate the antibiotic. So the antibiotic at the site of infection can be 50 times greater in concentration than it is in the bloodstream. And then after it does it wor its work, then it just slowly dissolves back into the blood. That's why it takes so long to get out. Seems to penetrate the tissues very well. Doesn't matter whether we're talking about the bone or the stomach or the uterus or the gallbladder. And interestingly, if you happen to be allergic to either erythromycin or clarithromycin, that's by axon, shouldn't take this drug because there's interaction. And obviously, since it's related to erythromycin, if you have an organism that is not capable of being treated, with the erythromycin, well, this one isn't going to work either. You don't have to worry about a lot of drug side effects. Shouldn't take it with uh, a drug called pimazide. Got to be careful with certain of the older HIV treating drugs. And it will change the effect of warfarin on your body. For the most part, when you take the drug, the typical z pack comes in either three day or five day. The standard is the five day. The five day is 250 milligrams. You take two pills day one. And then you take one pill, 250 milligrams, on day two, three, four, and five. Some people opt for, and in certain conditions it's acceptable, to take 500 milligrams each day for three days. Unusually, for genital infections, you would take 1,000 milligrams at one time, or for gonorrhea, some people go 2,000 milligrams at one time. Well, how does it work compared to other antibiotics? Works pretty good if we're talking about the susceptible organism. So let's say you have chronic lung disease. Does it work as well as, say, biaxin? Yeah, pretty much. The difference is that biaxin is two times a day and you have to do it for 10 days. Now, if you took the azithromycin, you could take a five-day z pack and that seems to work. Or you could take a three-day z pack and you could take 500 milligrams once a day for three days. For a bacterial sinusitis, well, works pretty good. Works about as well as the Augmentin. But again, the Augmentin you have to take several times a day. You've got to do it for 10 days as opposed to, say, a three-day course of the z pack Well, if you happen to have a community-acquired pneumonia, that's an, an otherwise healthy individual who just gets pneumonia, well, you can take azithromycin except if you're elderly or debilitated or your immune system doesn't work, because remember the immune system is required to wipe up the bacterial organisms that are just injured 
by the antibiotic. If you get your pneumonia while you're in the hospital or if you have cystic fibrosis or if you have bacteria in the bloodstream, this isn't the one for you. You need some more potent drug. And then side effects. Does it have side effects? You bet it does. And the side effects tend to be concentrated around the gastrointestinal system. So, if you take the drug, you have about a 30 to a 50 percent chance of having nausea, vomiting, horrible diarrhea, abdominal pain, upset stomach, dyspepsia, gas. If you're a woman, some vaginitis. And anyone can get some malaise. You don't feel well. You can have an allergic reaction to it. You get nervous. And interestingly, we've just recently learned that some people who take it have hearing loss or they develop ringing in the ears. And some people can develop a horrible skin reaction, a skin reaction that can go on to precipitate death, something called the Stevens-Johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis, really bad actors, fortunately very rare, but it can cause you to become sensitive to the sun and because it kills the good bacteria in your gut can cause an overgrowth of Clostridium difficile, they call that C. diff diarrhea, that can lead to horrible problems, again can lead to death. That's why people are getting stool transplants now because of the C. difficile diarrhea. It will say on the prescription that caution if you're taking an antibiotic, but it doesn't interact with the antibiotics. Even though the drug's been available since 1971, the Food and Drug Administration did not until 2017 add a warning that if it's given to kids within the first six weeks of life, it might cause a blockage between the stomach and the intestine, something we call pyloric stenosis. And in 2017, they also added the warning for the hypersensitivity reaction, severe allergies. But in 2013, again, for a drug that was developed in 1991, or marketed in 1991, it was until 2013 that they said, the FDA said, that my goodness, people who take the drug might have certain kind of electrical abnormalities of the heart that can lead to potentially fatal ventricular arrhythmias. In other words, you die from a heart attack or heart disease or sudden cardiac death if you take the drug. In some people, that was based on a 2012 study in the New England Journal of Medicine where they looked at the Tennessee Medicaid recipients and they looked at the people who took antibiotics and didn't take antibiotics and they compared drugs like amoxicillin and Cipro to the z or the Zithromycin. And what they found was that the people who take the Zithromycin had about a three-fold increase in their risk of death during the time they were taking the drug. They divided it into people who had average risk for heart disease or low risk for heart disease or high risk for heart disease. And actually, they found that per million courses, there were nine people who died if they were below risk for heart disease, 45 people who died if they were at average risk, but if they were at above risk, 245 people died from sudden cardiac death. So that's a warning that you have to pay attention to. Who's most at risk for this particular heart problem? People who have very slow heart rates, people who have an electrocardiographic abnormality that tends to run in the families or may be caused by certain kinds of drugs called a long QT syndrome or prolonged QT interval. People have low potassium, low magnesium. Those are risk factors. Well, the government also says that if you take the drug, you might develop hepatitis or hepatic necrosis or hepatic failure or you might die of liver disease. And they also say that peculiarly, it might somehow be associated with myasthenia gravis where the nerves don't tell the muscles how to work properly. How does the drug work? Well, the drug interacts with something known as ribosomal RNA and that prevents the protein synthesis that's necessary for the bacteria to grow. It doesn't inhibit their nucleic acid synthesis, but it just injures them by preventing some of the protein. It also more recently has been found to work on the body's immune system. So it interferes with something called quorum sensing and quorum sensing is a condition where the bacteria, depending on the number of bacteria and the interactions they have, 
kind of like humans when we're in a society versus when we're by ourselves. We do things differently. Well, quorum sensing is the turning on or turning off of bacterial genes. And when you turn on some of the genes that are typically off, then the bacteria can form biofilms. Biofilms are sort of like a saran wrap that develops in tissue. And the bacteria can live in the tissue. And then the body's antibodies from the inside can't kill them. And the antibiotics you take from the outside can't kill them. So that's very important. And remember, this is a bacteriostatic drug. It injures but doesn't kill the bug. It requires the body's immune system to take control. It is not bactericidal, except in those instances where it really is highly concentrated, as it is in some infections, because it's taken in there by the phagocytes. Now, the good news is that it doesn't seem to interact with a lot of other drug metabolism, so you don't have to worry about it when you take too many other kinds of drugs except that pimazide, and you've got to be a little careful with the warfarin. But if you're going to take an antacid, stay away from the drug for at least two hours, either before or after, if you're taking the mylanta or the malox or the rolades or even the milk of magnesia. And the good news, the real good news is that while the brand name drug is going to cost you about 200 bucks or more, if you pay cash for the generic drug, it's only going to cost you about $20 to $40 for a course. Or if you go to a place like GoodRx and get a free coupon, it might even be cheaper than using your insurance, and then it only costs you about $10 to $20. So remember, azithromycin or the z pack it's a good antibiotic if we're talking about treating bacterial infections, not the common cold, not a virus. If we're talking about a bacterial infection caused by a susceptible bacteria. This is a relatively good drug, but it's going to cause a lot of gastrointestinal side effects, and if you're a woman, may cause some vaginitis as well, and because we overuse the drug so much, there's a lot of bacterial resistance that's developing, so do be careful. If you have a common cold, don't run to the doctor. Seeing one of us isn't really going to do you much good. In fact, you might end off worse for the interaction. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.